one of the good things about preaching is that um, you don't need to be wise according uh, to this world to be a good preacher because God's given us his whole Bible, 66 books full of his words. So it makes it very easy to, to be a preacher when, you, when you've got a whole book full of God's words. So uh, it was just a thought that came to me during the, um, during the time of worship is that for, to be a preacher, you, just, you need God's words. And God has preserved his words for us today and uh, in the King James Bible, which makes it very, very exciting to preach. Because uh, like the prophets of old, we can preach God's very words. And so if you're there in 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, if you can turn to verse 19. Have a look at verse 19. It says there, For we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And the title of my sermon tonight is A More Sure Word. A More Sure Word. And what I want to preach about is the word of God tonight. I want to preach about how God has preserved his very words for us to have today. And what I want to talk about is how God's words are our foundation for our faith. Everything that we do in this life as a saved person, it's based on the foundation of God's words. And I want to talk about from the Bible and show some examples how God has actually given his words to man, but not only given his words to man, but also preserved those words to make sure that man has always had his words, God's very words, because it's a foundation of our faith. So God needs to make sure we always have those words. And keep reading there in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we have a more sure word because we're speaking the very words that the Holy Ghost teaches, the very words of God. And a more sure word than that of man. Back there in verse, if you jump back to verse 16, Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter's saying when he's preaching Jesus to the people, he's not using man's wisdom, he's not preaching from the past philosophers, or he's not using his own private interpretation of what he thinks the scriptures say. He's preaching the very words of God. He doesn't use the cunning craftiness and devised fables of man. And now because God's word is our foundation, God's word is the foundation of everything that we do as a believer, our preaching, our, our living. God needs to make sure that he preserves those words for us. And let me just read to you from Numbers 23 verse 19. So we're not trusting in man's words, we're trusting in God's words, and God has made sure by his power that we have those words. Let me read to you Numbers 23 verse 19. You don't need to turn there. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? Or have he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So God's not a man, so we can trust God's words, because a man can lie. A man can be deceiving and not 100% truthful, but God's saying to us, he's not like that. You can trust God's word. So it's God in his power has enabled us to have his word. Just turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And have a look at what it says there. It says, according as his divine power have given us, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So I'll just stop there for a second. God in his divine power has made sure that we've had his words. We need his words if we're going to pertain unto life and godliness. And in his power, he's made sure that today we do have his words. Let's keep, let's keep reading. Through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So for us to be able to be partakers of the divine nature and all the promises that God has for us, well, we need to have God's promises. We need to have God's words. And in his divine power, he's made sure that we've had everything that we need and what we need is God's words. And he's, he's, he's enabled us to have those words. So the first point I want to talk about tonight and uh, I've got six points for you. And the first point is that 
that man today does not speak God's very words. And what I mean by that, we don't have the, the authority and the power from God now to say, thus says the Lord, and then speak a word, and then have you brought that down as scripture. Whereas in times past, the prophets and the apostles, they did have that power, but today we don't have that power. And that's something that we need to understand because there's many churches and many so-called preachers and prophets that will, will say that God told me to tell you this. And they'll speak as if they've got the authority from God to speak his very words. And that's something that God does not allow us to do today. So if we want to have a more sure word, we've got to make sure that we're not deceived by these people who come saying, I've got a sure word from God to you, when actually they don't. So that's why I'm, that's my first point. So turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. But however, you can speak God's very words if you take, take the book and you open this book and say, God says, and then you read it, then you are speaking God's very words. But you can't, outside of the 66 uh, books in the canon of the King James Bible, you can't just make stuff up and say it's God, because God does not do that anymore. And we're going to look at why that is. Have a look there, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past, unto the fathers by the prophets, have in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So notice there it says, God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past, meaning not now, but in times past. He spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. Have in these last days, so moving on to the days that we're in right now, he, spoke, he has spoken unto us by his Son. So we have a better witness than the prophets. The prophets were like a foreshadow or a picture of the one that would come and that would speak God's very words. Because the prophets, they did speak God's very words as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And they were a picture or a type of the great prophet that would come, which is Jesus Christ. So once Jesus has come, now we have his words and we can just have God's words through him and through the scriptures. So turn to Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23, and we'll look at another passage in there which talks about there being a time where God no longer speaks to the through the prophets in the way that he once did in times past. So Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 31. So I want to read to you from this uh, passage here in the, in the context of the, the day that we live in right now. And it's going to make a lot of sense. It says there, Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. So there's people saying, God told me to say this, and, and, he's, and he's saying these things as if God told them to say it. But God's saying, I did not tell them, I did not send them to do it, which is what happens today. says there, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And when this people or the prophet or a priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt say, then you, you sorry, thou shalt then say unto them, What burden I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. So we don't have a burden from the Lord. The Old Testament prophets, they used to say that they had a burden from the Lord, which was the same as saying a word from the Lord against the city, or you might remember that uh, there was a burden against Nineveh, which is what, um, what was the prophet's name? Not Jonah, the second guy? I forget now. He had a burden to preach against Nineveh, or a word from God against a city or a certain subject. Have a look there, it says, when people do that, when they come now and they say, I've got a burden from the Lord for you, brother, or for your church, it says there that it shall not profit these people at all. It doesn't, it doesn't profit anymore. If you want to bless somebody, so look, I read this great verse in the Bible, Sam, I want to share with you. It says, Blessed are they lay that born, for they shall be comforted. This, I've spoke the very words of God to you. And that's a blessing. That's going to profit somebody. That was just a random verse there. It wasn't from the Lord, <laughs> so to speak. So we can see there that Jeremiah is foreshadowing a time or picturing a time when people are going to come speaking in the name of the Lord where God says, well, I haven't spoken to them anymore. Oh, on verse 34, let's keep reading. It says there, And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say, the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. 
Thus shall ye say, everyone to his neighbour and everyone to his brother, What have the Lord answered, and what have the prophets spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. That's what people are doing today in Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches. They are perverting, perverting the word of the Lord by just making stuff up at random. And if you've been in charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, you know that it's right for the whole church. It'll be people will come up here and just give a prophecy, make stuff up, and say God's saying this, and your person will pick some other crowd, and I've got a word for you, and just make stuff up. It doesn't profit at all, and it's deceiving, and it's not a sure word. We have a more sure word, and that's the title of my sermon, a more sure word than that. We have a more sure word than people's imaginations. And that's the King James Bible. And the second point I have for you tonight is God's word is the foundation of our faith. God's word is the foundation of our faith. In Psalms, 100, uh, Psalms 11, verse 3, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So the righteous, we need to have the foundation of God's word. And the good news is that our foundations can't be destroyed if we have our foundation as the word of God and as Jesus Christ himself. It cannot be destroyed, so we're going to always be sound and strong on the word of God. We only can come off our foundation if we choose to, if we start to listen to a different Bible version or listen to false teachers, or get out of church, then we can move away from the firm foundations. But the good news is our foundations can never be destroyed. And we need to have God's very words. We need to have God's very words, and we do have them in, in the King James Bible, which is what I'm saying tonight, a more sure word. So how can you know how to live and please God if you don't have God's words? Like how can my children know how to please me and Aaron if they don't know what our commandments are? They, they can't do it. And it's the same with us. We need to have God's words. If we want to know how to go to heaven, well, we need to have God's words. And if we don't have the words in our language, then how can we be sure of anything? We have no foundations. And what can the righteous do? So we do have a, a more sure word. And this reminds me of a conversation I had with a, um, a family member we were debating the King James Bible. I was saying it's the word of God. All the other versions are false. And, and, and this guy... We were just debating and just against the King James Bible. And I said, well, is there an accurate version of the scriptures in English? And this guy said, no. He said, there's not. You've got to read the original, man the original manuscripts. And I said to him, well, how do you even know you're saved? Because how can you be sure? What can the righteous do? How can you know if you're saved if you don't have God's very words? And that's why God, in his divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and to God. We have his very words. You can be 100% confident of that. If you can turn to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, and while you're turning there, let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the word of God and Jesus Christ are one and the same, one and the same. So you'll then, in John chapter 1, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as, oh sorry, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we can see that Jesus Christ, and the Word of God are one and the same. So if you're basing your life on Jesus, you're basing your life on the Word of God and vice versa. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24. God has given us a sure foundation that we can live and base our life upon and, and trust in, which is the Word of God. Matthew 7, verse 24 says there, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. So we can see Jesus' sayings, well, Jesus' word, is our firm foundation. It's the rock which we can live our lives upon. And if we have those words, obey those words, then we're going to stand in the time of trouble and temptation 
and tribulation. My third point I want to talk about is how has God delivered his word to man? How has God delivered his word to man? Because we're seen in his divine power, he's enabled us to have his words, but how has that played out? How, how, is, how is, has he done that? Have a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, you turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, and I'll read to you from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. So you're turning to Exodus chapter 32. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we can see there the apostles and the prophets, along with Jesus, are the foundation. It's because they're foundational ministries, and they actually spoke God's very words. The prophets spoke God's words. The apostles spoke God's words because they're laying a foundation. They're laying a foundation. See, the foundation's already been laid by those who spoke God's very words. So we don't continue to build a foundation. We don't continue to have apostles and prophets like in the Old Testament and in the days of Jesus and the apostles because we, we, have, the, we have the foundation built already. We're now building the house by the words of God that they've already spoken. And they were foundational ministries. So we don't, you don't spend 2,000 years building foundations and not start building the house. And we're building the house today based on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So let's have a look at an example of how God gave us his words. So he gave us his words for the, the prophets and the apostles uh, as they were building the foundation, laying the foundation. But let's have a look at Exodus chapter 32 and verse 15. Exodus 32 verse 15 says there, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hands. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other side they were written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. So we can see here that, that God gave Moses his very words and engraved them on stone. So we can see God giving his very words to Moses or to man to have them forever. And the words that Moses received in stone, we still have that today. Like 2,000, 3,000 years later, we still have the same words. So when God gives his words to man, it's forever and ever and ever, and it cannot pass away. We always have those words. And I think being written in, in tables of stone is a picture of once God's words written, man can't change it. It's engraved, in, it's engraved in stone. We can't change it. People will try and come up with fake versions, but that doesn't take away that God's word is always going to be with us and it's unchangeable and it, and it can't be changed by man. That's why we have it right here today and it hasn't, hasn't changed at all. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1, I'll just read that one to you. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. So we can see here God speaking to Jeremiah saying, Get all, all my words I've spoken to you, write them down in a book. And here we have the, the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And notice there it says that all these words, that so God cares about every jot and tittle of the law. He cares about every word. Every word's important to God. And we have his exact words today. He's given us his words and they've persevered and they have been are uh, protected throughout the ages and we still have them today. So it's not God's thoughts or God's general gist that we have, it's his words that he wants to impart to mankind and make sure we have them, and we do have them. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 36, if you can turn there. Jeremiah 36 and verse 1. And let's keep looking at how God has given his words to man. And this is God in his divine power making sure we have everything that we need that, per that pertains to life and to godliness. It says there, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations 
from the day I spoke unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I propose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. So here we can see man again getting God's words. Jeremiah spoke God's very words. God spoke the words to Jeremiah. He spoke them to his scribe, and the scribe wrote them down word for word, and here we have God's words. And just jump down to verse 8, says there, And Barak the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book of the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So he, he wrote down all the words that Jeremiah told him to write. Jump over to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, it says there, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. So whenever God gives us his words, it's forever and ever. He doesn't give us his words once and then it disappears. He gives us the word one time and we have it forever and ever and ever. See, Jeremiah, I mean, Isaiah wrote down these words 2,700 or so years ago, and we still have them here today. God was true to his word. We, they have been forever and ever. In 100 years' time, we're still going to have the, the same words. So we can see God is faithful in giving us his words. And the fourth point I want to make is that God preserves his words. God preserves his words. So turn to Psalm 12, verse 6. You guys all know this one. It's one of our memory verses. God preserves his words. Man has tried to destroy God's words, but God in his divine power has seen to it that the word continues on and perseveres and is preserved. It says there, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God has promised to pre preserve his words forever. Every generation has God's words. And if you look at the English language, it's so incredible that as soon as, mo as modern English became a thing, virtually straight away the, the King James Bible arrives on the scene. Like even the Bibles before the King James Bible, they were like hard to read. Like I've read them to my children. The words are all crazy and, the, and there's Fs in all these weird places and it's not readable English, but as soon as English becomes modern, straight away, God in his divine power brings about the circumstances in, 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 the, in King James, the King James Bible. And it's persevered, as long as there's been English, there's been the King James Bible, and it's been blessed by God. So we can see that God has been faithful to his word to preserve us his words in the King James Bible. But let's, let's look at some more examples in the Bible about how man has tried to destroy God's word and God in his power has continued to, to make sure that word is uh, preserved. So have a look at Jeremiah 36. So back to Jeremiah 36. I should have told you to stay there. Uh, verse 27. Jeremiah 36, verse 27 to 28. Let's have a look what it says there. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burnt the roll, and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write it in all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, have burned. So you might know the story when the, the scroll was read to um, the king, and the king was offended, upset, and tried to destroy the word of God and threw it in the fire. And God didn't go, Oh, well, we tried. God says, No, Jeremiah, write it all out again. And Jeremiah is a big book. I just finished reading Jeremiah not long ago. It's a massive book. And Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, write out the words again. Now, it's going to be preserved, Jeremiah. Now, people might try and burn it and whatever, but Jeremiah, write it out again. It's, it's my words. It's forever and ever. And then jump down to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there was added besides unto them 
many like words, which is fantastic, isn't it? More words. Well, let's just not just but return it to the same um, amount of words. But let's add more words. So the king actually causes us to be blessed today. We have more words, more chapters in Jeremiah than what we would have had if he didn't throw it in the fire. So we can see here God is zealous over his word and preserves his words. So turn back to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And let's look at God preserving his word again. Exodus 32 verse 19. And it says there, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, this is after he had the, the tables of stone with the Ten Commandments, this is Moses, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. So we can see there that Moses broke the Ten Commandments. And we've broken the Ten Commandments as well, haven't we? We've broken all the commandments just like Moses did. He broke all of them. But that wasn't the end. Turn to uh, over a couple of chapters to Exodus 34, verse 1. So in his anger, Moses has broken the Word of God and destroyed that copy of the Word of God. So Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. So again, like in Jeremiah, we can see God preserving his words. We need to write them again, Moses. You need to come back up on the mountain and let's do it again. These words are going to be forever and ever. And that's just the picture of how God feels about all of his word, not just the Ten Commandments, not just the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah. It's a principle which applies to all the word of God. It's forever and ever. And God's going to personally see to it that we have his words. We have his very words because we need all things that pertain to life and godliness. And God needs divine power. It's made sure that's happened. So we can be supremely confident that we have his words. We have the words in the King James Bible. And turn to verse 28, Exodus 34, 28. Now just down to verse 28. It says there, And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he had came down from the mount, that Moses wished not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And that was from Exodus 34, 28 to verse 29. So he comes back down with the words of God again. So we might not have the original stones, that the Ten Commandments are written on, but that's not the point. It's not the original copy that matters, it's the very words. And we can see that God also, he doesn't care so much about the original manuscripts or the original stones. What he cares about is that the words carry on, and that's what's happened. So this is a great story in Luke chapter 4. If you can turn to Luke chapter 4, 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and we're going to see Jesus reading the Word of God. And Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says there, and this is about Jesus, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, so, or Isaiah. Now, Isaiah wrote the original copy about 700 years before that. And Jesus knew that, well, this is still legit. This is still the word of God, because he knew his father preserves the word. So Jesus didn't say, oh guys, this is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It's, it's been ruined. It's been words that have been taken out and added in. Jesus didn't say, look, go out in the, in the wilderness and under a rock, under a tree. So many caves, you'll find uh, a scroll, dig that up. And that was a copy of Isaiah's copy. No, Jesus didn't care for that. Just like Moses didn't care or God didn't care for the original stones. Jesus didn't care for the original manuscript that Isaiah wrote. And we shouldn't be all hung up on trying to dig up manuscripts from the first century, the second century. If it's from, like Jesus didn't care it was 700 years old. If God can preserve his word for 700 years, he can preserve his words for 3,000 years. Because it's his divine power and he's done that. So let's keep reading. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, I just like this part so much. He says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's just incredible that Jesus, when Jesus says that. He said, today this scripture has been fulfilled. He closes the book, sits down. Today this scripture has been fulfilled. Because it was right. It was preserved. It was God's very words. And he could say that. Just amazing. It would have been great to have been there to, to see that. Incredible. So again, we can see that he has preserved his words. And also, a point I want to make also is that if you're a saved believer, God can get the King James Bible to you. There's a way he, he can do it. Like, I know when I first got saved, I did know about Bible versions and which one I should read. But in my mum's house, there was a King James Bible, and that's the one I first grabbed and started to read. Because God made sure I had access to, to his words. As a saved believer, he made sure in his divine power there was a King James Bible there. But unfortunately... I got deceived and started reading the New King James Bible for a long time. But God still provided the King James Bible. And all you guys here today, you understand it's the King James Bible. So he's provided you, or everybody here today, with his very words. And I want to look at an example from from two kings where God did the exact same thing that we're talking about, how there was a godly man who didn't have the Bible and God gave it to him so he could then excel uh, as a man of God and as a king. So turn to... 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 3. Second Kings chapter 22 and verse 3, it says, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah. At this time, King Josiah was about 26 years old. If you go back and read um, previously to that uh, verse, you can work it out. He was 26 that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house unto carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to build the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. So Josiah is saying, go to the house of the Lord, uh, get some finances together so we can then support and fund the work of the Lord to, to build these things. And which was, that was the circumstances God used to get the word of God into the hands of Josiah, because Josiah was the godly king. He's one of the great kings in, in the Bible. And at this point here, he's 26 years old, and yet, and he hasn't yet had the word of God. You might realize, you might recall that King Josiah's granddad was the very wicked king, King Manasseh. But King Manasseh, you might realize that in later in his life, got saved, and he, and then after he got saved, he repented of his of his wickedness, and he pulled down all the altars of Baal and all those um, idols that were set up in the kingdom and did a great, great work and undone a lot of the evil that he did. But Manasseh's son, who became king after him, was a wicked king. So I would say that his son wasn't brought up right because Manasseh at that, at that stage was a wicked king. So he became king and he was a wicked king. It's King Amon, Amon, I think it was. But he reigned for a very short time and then his grandson, Josiah, starts to become king at the age of eight. And he was a godly king, and I believe that was because of his granddad's influence upon his life. Because later in life, when he's saved, he's got his grandson Josiah, and he's teaching him what's right, how to serve God properly. So Josiah is a, a godly man, but as we're going to see in a minute, he doesn't yet have the Bible in his hands. So verse 8 there says, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shephan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. So it seems like it's always been there. It's always been in church. It's always been in the house of the Lord, but it's, it's been lost, like it's gone to the back of the bookshelf, so to speak, and they haven't known it was there. And Shaphan... Uh, oh, there wasn't. Uh, found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hekiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. 
And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, My servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest have delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes, and the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbar the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Uzziah, a servant of the king's, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that which is written concerning us. So he finds the word of God, that God in his providence and his divine power gets the, the Bible into the hands of Josiah. And when that happens, this is like dynamite in the life of Josiah because, you know, he goes on and does a great, incredible work. He tears down the altars and destroys the, ha the homes, the houses of the Sodomites, does an incredible work for God. And that happens after God gives him the Bible, after God gives him the words of God and it just sets him on fire it's like pouring fuel on the fire but the thing is he needed to have the word of God he needed to have God's very words to realize that they were not living according to God's standards so we can see God in his providence can give anybody who's a, a, a genuine saved person who loves God can give them the word of God so there's no excuse to someone not reading the King James Bible my second last point is that we can be confident that the right books are in the Bible. We can be confident that God has preserved the right books in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that there wasn't lost books that God wanted to be in there which didn't make it, or there's, there's books that maybe are snuck in there which shouldn't have been in there. That's not the case at all. We can be 100% confident that the right books are included in the Old Testament and also the New Testament. But, but now let's just look at the Old Testament, and I'll show you how we can be 100% certain that the right books have been included. So turn to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. And again, this is one of my favourite stories in the Bible, and Pastor Kevin talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. So Luke 4, 24, verse 13, says there, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called, called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, has not known the things which had come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deeds and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Ye and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said, um, said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even as the women had said. But they saw, but they saw, but him they saw not. Sorry. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, have a look at this here. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus gives them the best Bible study ever, and he turns to all the scriptures. So he turns to Genesis, he turns to Exodus, he turns to Levit Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and so on and so forth. So they actually know what Bibles are to be included in the scripture because Jesus turned to all of them. And guess what? He didn't turn to the book of Enoch. So that'd be making a mental note, okay, discard the book of Enoch. They didn't turn to the book of Jubilees. They didn't turn to the life of the prophets. 
he didn't, he didn't turn to the book of Joshua. So they're thinking, okay, tell the apostles, disregard you know, disregard Joshua, but he turned to all the books that we, all the 39 books. He said all the scriptures, he turned to the Psalms, he turned to Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, he turned to all these verses to show them where, where they declare himself. So we can be 100% confident that these are the right books. Okay, but not only these two guys on the road to Emmaus, jump down to verse 45, Luke 24 and verse 45. Have a look there. It says there, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the, the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So we can see there, with, this is with the 11 apostles, he opened their understanding of the scriptures. How did he do that? Well, he turned to the scriptures, just like the guys on the road to Emmaus. He turns to all the scriptures again and he opens their understanding to the scriptures. So the apostles knew what Jesus sanctioned or canonized as scripture and they were able to ensure that it was passed down through the churches. So we can be supremely confident that the right words are in the Old Testament. So what about the New Testament? What about the New Testament? Well, you're then, you were there in 2 Peter. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. How can we even be sure that the New Testament is the Word of God? Well, let's have a look. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. It says there, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. The Old Testament scriptures, right? And of the commandment, commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. So he's comparing what the apostles wrote with the Old Testament scriptures. So what the apostles wrote was scripture, according to Peter, at the same level as the Old Testament prophets. And also go, go down to verse 15, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you. So what about Paul's writings? Were they scripture? Let's have a look. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things, of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which they that are unsta unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So, so Peter is elevating Paul's writings with the other scriptures at the same level as the other scriptures. So can you see that there? So we're seeing the New Testament written by the apostles is considered by Peter and Paul to be scripture just like the Old Testament prophets. It's so the same, same um, level of authority, I guess, if you like, as, as God's word. And God has preserved the New Testament as well for the apostles, for the writings of the apostles. So moving on to my last point now, and I'll just about to wrap it up. And that is, we still have, point six, we still have God's word today. And let me just read to you from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28. If you turn to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, if you can turn to Matthew 13, I'll read to you Jeremiah 23 and verse 28. And this is really interesting here. This is like a, an Old Testament prophecy about all the false Bible versions we're going to have today. Let's have a look. It says there, The prophet that have a dream, let him tell the dream, and he that have my word... Let him speak my word faithfully. And what is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? So there's the, the wheat, which is God's pure words. When we speak God's words faithfully, that's, that's the wheat, and that's the King James Bible. But what is the chaff? What is the, uh, what, sorry, what is the chaff to the wheat? So as well as having the wheat of God's word, the pure words of God, the King James Bible, there's all this chaff everywhere. And if we're not preaching the word Faithfully, the New King, not, not the New King James, if you're not preaching the Word of God faithfully, the King James Bible, then you're preaching the chaff. It's not the words of God at all. It's not faithful to God's words. And we see an interesting parable which I think applies to this as, a, as maybe as a secondary application. It can apply to this uh, problem we have, all these false Bible versions. So it, you're there in Matthew 13, verse 24, and this will be the last passage we'll read today. Matthew 13, 24, let's have a look here. 
another parable he put here forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed, as the King James Bible, in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, which is all the false versions, and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, this not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then have it tears? He said unto them, An enemy had done this. The servants said unto him, Look though then that we go and gather them up. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye rid up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, uh, but gather the wheat into the barn. So in, in a sense that can apply to all the, all the false Bible versions, which are like the tares, which the devil has sown to try and deceive people and confuse people. Yet there's always going to be the wheat of the Word of God. We have a more sure Word of God than all those corrupted versions. And I just want to close on, on this point, is that if, if God for, can, can preserve the words of, of, the, of, of God that were written on stone to Moses, if he can preserve the words that Jeremiah wrote that the king destroyed, if he can get Jer uh, Isaiah to write the exact words, then he can also give us his exact words today in the King James Bible. And it's what we have here today. So we can be supremely confident that this is 100% perfect, just the way God intended us to have it here today. All right, let's pray.